Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with Tamara. I have my new favorite coffee mug, which is funny. I got it on the USS Midway. I just went there with my son. So I feel like we're talking about some naval things today. So maybe like it's the appropriate mug to have for today. Um, I'm really excited for today's episode. I just want to remind everybody out there a couple things. One is this is live and anything goes. So we're going to dig deep. I'm going to ask David a lot of questions, but also you have the opportunity to ask questions. So whether you're on LinkedIn, YouTube, or our Facebook channel, you can put them in the comments. You can reach out to us. I love questions. I actually got a few in ahead of time when I announced this. So I'm going to pepper those in, but I love it because it allows us to connect with our community. What I love even more is that I get to bring on people who have done really amazing things and dig into not just the experience itself, but the lessons learned. And then ultimately, and particularly in David's case, the lessons that they get to teach other people, we all get to learn from them. So I'm pretty excited about this. So let me, with all that, introduce today's fantastic guest who, I just want to say, David, I, actually, let me introduce you. I'm getting ahead of myself, as we can all tell. Um, so David Marquet is a retired Navy captain. He's the best-selling author of Turn the Ship Around, and Language is Leadership. And he's working on a pretty exciting one now that I hope we have a chance to dig into. I'm going to give you the one sentence of his background and I'll let him really dig into it because there's so much in, in here. So he was assigned to and then trained to be the captain of the USS Olympia. So for 12 months, he was kind of working his way in, learning the submarine, um, getting everything like in ready to be captain. And this was a, make sure I get it right, nuclear powered attack submarine. So he spent a year, just over a year actually, right? Kind of being trained to be captain to then be suddenly moved over to the USS Santa Fe, which is also, I think, a nuclear submarine and which was the worst performing fleet at the time and a submarine that I think for the rest of us who don't really understand it is actually operates differently than the other ones. So they're not all the same. So here you were, you were being trained to do one thing and then you were moved over not only to another situation, but also to a fleet that wasn't even performing. So I'm going to stop my intro there, David, and let you expand on that experience because I think there's so much in there. So thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Tamara, and thank you, thank you, thank you for all the listeners, especially the live ones who are um, sharing their precious time with us here today. Yeah, so my situation was, uh, this was very traumatic to me, the moment when I heard I was going to go to, go to the Santa Fe. The, the reason was because the ship was doing very poorly in performance and very poorly in morale, and the captain quit, resigned mm -hmm. uh, a year early. And so now we have the Navy has a submarine, no captain. And I had just finished this long pipeline for a different kind of submarine. By the way, a kind that I'd, I'd been on, I, I was familiar with the reactor plan and all that. And they said, no, 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 Marque, you're going to Santa Fe. You just finished the schooling. And, the, and mm -hmm. as you said, it was a different kind of submarine. Now, the physics were the same. The theory was the same, but the actual... Uh, it was a different reactor plant, had missile tombs I'd never seen before, wow. drove to the ocean differently because bow planes. And so all of a sudden I'm thrust in the situation where the model of the leader gives orders and the crew does what they're told is not going to work because I'm the wrong guy to be given orders. Now we tried it because it's habit, but I gave an order, it was the wrong order, the crew tried to do it, and then finally one of the junior one of the youngest guys on the submarine was like, well, it's can't do that on this ship. It's not it's a not a two speed motor. It's a one speed motor. So shifting into second gear makes no sense. And they kind of came out. And now I I really had to get into, quote, empowerment. Yeah. Of course, I always wanted it. We always want it. And we yeah. talk about it and we say we want distributed thinking and decision making. But we're all more enemies because as soon as we enact the model of leader makes decisions. What's happening is the leader's deciding what to do and the team's deciding how to do it. We And I've had people say, oh yeah, yeah, that's empowerment. When we, when you do that, that's empowerment. And I was like, I used to think that, but I don't think that anymore. I think getting the team involved in what we need to do, now that's empowerment. You still need structure and you still need to be aligned to the organizational objectives. But every once in a while, the crew's got to say, well, what are we going to do? Now, we don't get to decide, pick up the SEAL team, don't pick up the SEAL team. Right. 
but submerge the ship, start the reactor, load the, load a torpedo. So in the old model was, I would say, load this torpedo and that torpedo tube tomorrow at 10 o'clock. New model, the weapons officer would come to me and he would know enough about the future to say, hey, Captain, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I intend to load this torpedo and that torpedo tube in order to support the mission. And we talk about it. So that, um, it's more than just empowerment. I call it emancipation and I call it a leader, leader organization because instead of having leaders and followers, thinkers and doers, white collar, blue collar, and these we have these language artifacts that sort of um, create mm -hmm. this caste system as I see it. And uh, it's not what we want in the 21st century. So fortunately we didn't kill anybody and we worked through it. It was all through language. We changed the language and it had this huge impact. So um, so that's what the Turn of Ship Around story is about. And it really got me invested in the power of language to change workplaces and, and to, to free the thinking and let us be human at work, say what we really believe and what we really think and raise our hand when we're in a meeting and we just have like, hey, I'm, only, I'm like only 2% sure about this but i think this might be a bad idea right mm. i think this product might not be ready for prime time but i'm willing to raise my hand and i have a structure for for saying that so i want to back up for a second and first of all i want to say that you then got the highest inspection ever given right after turning the ship around literally yeah well yeah yeah i mean it, it worked we didn't know it at the time but it worked the morale soared every sailor signed up saying the navy got the highest score uh, in the history for this one particular inspection that the Navy gave us. And the history that they didn't have, they didn't have records for a submarine ever getting a higher score. But the wow. really, the thing that I'm proudest of, and I think the biggest impact happened 10 years later, at, long after I was gone, which is that 10 of these officers got selected and screened mm -hmm. through enough wickets that they became submarine commanders, which is a really highly disproportionate number. And so what we say is, we're creating more leaders, not more followers. Yeah. So I love to, because I, I, I do my research, and I've known you for a while now. We met at a keynote. Oh, my gosh. I think it was in, like, I'm not sure. I, I'm going to say Kansas City and for yeah. a group of but I'm not, yeah. I'm not hunted, but I think that's what it was. We ended up sharing an Uber. So what, what I heard you say at one point, though, was on a video I watched was instead of having one leader and 134 doers, yeah. You have 135 thinkers or yeah. 135 leaders. I want to, I love that, right? And I think in theory for a lot of us, that sounds like I, that's what I want. I'm so tired of my people pushing problems up, right? I'm so tired of them not going the extra credit. And I think now with the generational differences, I'm hearing even more and more of that. Like, why do I have to tell them what to do? Yet, I also feel like in the same breath, I hear I'm the only one that knows how. They don't know what I know. Um, I need to make the decisions, the responsibilities on me, right? Fill in the blank. It's like yeah. talking about a both sides. So how did you, how do you go from, all right, I got to change. I want this intent-based leadership, right? As you call it. Yeah. But I'm stuck in this hierarchical model. And I think that's just, well, obviously the military is very command control, right? But I think it's true in corporate and other clients I've worked with too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, we're, we're flat here. We're, we yeah. don't have, and it's just, uh, it's just, it's on so many ways. It's just nonsense. Um, but you start with yourself and you start with language. Mm -hmm. We believe that we act our way to new thinking. We don't mindset our way into new action. So once mm -hmm. like in your head, if you like it starts with a, a determination to do something different. So maybe that's mindset. Oh, I want to be a runner or I want to be, uh, I want an, a culture of empowerment. And when, what we do with teams is we'll say, hey, let's write a script for a TV series where the, the team is sitting around a, a table. And when, when someone watches this little scene, they're going to say, that's the most empowered team I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason this works is because they now have, now have to take this concept, the fuzzy concept of empowerment, and put it in specific words. And then we say, okay, great. Now practice those words and then you'll feel empowered. That's how we think it works. So for, for us, a big word was this word of intent. 
we were always boxed between two uncomfortable places. One was permission, which is designed to stop things from happening because if anyone in the chain says no, it doesn't happen. Right. And any one of the stakeholders, if you, there's an article about Bayer recently in the Wall Street Journal, they're making a, yeah. a what I think is a laudable transformation change in the culture. It, one, they bought Monsanto and they had the, the lawsuits with the Roundup, which is bad luck. But two is, it's just too hard to get stuff done there. And, yeah. and they talked about, well, you have eight stakeholders and six are happy, but two aren't. Then you got to, you revamp the product and you go, then you got to go back to all eight again. It's just, it's a permission based. So permission. And then the other side is just do stuff. Well, I take on personal risk. I'm just going to do it. Neither of these are what you want. What you want is intent where you say, look, I, here's what I see. Here's what I think Here's what we intend to do as a team. And now I'm communicating it so people can stop it. Like and literally, and hopefully, there's one, there's one or maybe two stakeholders who have actual veto power, and then there's other people who can collaborate. So they say, well, that's great. If you do that, though, we need to do this first. So now you have self. So it, it, you only have teamwork if people are saying what they're doing before they do it. If they're saying what they did, it's not teamwork. We're reacting to each other. So. So it starts with language, it starts with intent. And when, when you, so you state your intent to your boss and your team states, you invite them to state it to you. Now they might not say it, they might, say, they might be so stuck and tell me what to do is like, and then you just give them, just ask them, invite them to description. It's always, what do you see? What do you think? What do you intend to do? What do you see? What do you think? What do you intend to do? It always starts with description because it's safe. Well, just tell me more about it. Like, what do you see? What do you know that I don't know? And you get them talking, okay, now, so what do you think is going, what's the real problem here? And then, then you go to action. Well, what should we do? So I just got a great question in that fits into all of this. Sally just asked, can you give me an example of some language that I might be using that sucks? <laughs> I love how you asked that. And David, I hope in that you'll share the word they, because you talked about that all those years ago when we were at that same engagement. Yeah. And it stuck with me all these, I mean, that was yeah, 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 yeah. years ago, but it stuck with me. Okay, Sally, I love that question, and I love the honesty that uh, that's brutal honesty behind it. So, so I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll tell you language that that I've been using yeah. that sucks. Number one, we they. There's a lot. We had a lot of days. We had uh, there's about 140 people on a submarine, but we had days by rank. We had days by department. And yeah. so we had micro tribes. We didn't have one big tribe. So one day I got pissed off, and I was like. There's no they on Santa Fe, which rhymed, was very convenient. And people had to say we. And so, again, we're acting our way to new thinking because by saying we, it sends a signal to my brain. We, in my tribe, trust them, collaborate with them. They, not in my tribe, don't trust them, compete with them. So it's the word that shapes the brain. Not I, I could put up all the posters I want about, oh, we're one big team, blah, blah, blah. doesn't make a difference. The language changes it. And then... So, so just outlaw the word we and try and grow. When I go to an organization, I'll, I'll walk around and talk about, hey, what, what, what do you guys do here? Oh, we're marketing. Okay, what about these guys? Oh, they're in engineering. Boom, team boundary. Yeah. doesn't matter what the org chart says. Number two, binary self-affirming uh, quote questions. And I'll put that in, in, in quotes. Yeah. Does that make sense? We good, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody happy? All of these things are simply there to get mindless bobblehead head nodding. I just imagine, right. hey, we good? So, so look, we've done all this work. 737 Max is ready to go. We got to catch up with Airbus. We got the FAA on board. So we're all good with launching the product, right? Everybody happy? Yep, yep, good, good. Yeah, bobbleheads, bobbleheads, bobbleheads. Oh, yeah. You know, dogs bo bobbleheading on the back of a of a, of a car, and. Don't say that because I, I would I would hear someone say, I would hear myself say and say, hey, well, do you really want people to tell you what, what they're thinking? Yes. Well, then why do you ask a question like that? It just made it harder for someone to say, no, it doesn't make sense. No, I don't understand. So we want to ask, what doesn't make sense? How could this go wrong? You have to invite that this this disconfirming. Yeah perspective. And you say, oh, well, that's gonna take a lot of time. And I just want people to do what they're told. Yeah, that's the industrial age programming running. And, and, right. and then even when we we don't want that, 
the programming is still back here and we still say these things. That's why it seems so natural to say. So I want to share two things with you on that, because like I said, that they story that you told all those years ago really is stuck with me. And one of the things I, so I started doing it with my kids. So they'd say like, well, the teacher, right, they changed the deadline. So I didn't get my report in on time. And I'd be like, okay, if you remove they, what does that look like? And they'd stop and they'd go, I didn't plan ahead. Right. right, right, right. Now we can have a real conversation. So in my house, we're not allowed to use they, thanks to you. <laughs> so, I well, I think it teaches ownership and accountability and forces you to really think about what's your part in it. So maybe someone else did drop the ball somewhere. It happens, but you still have to take account of it. So I love that. The second thing is I realized, I want to get your take on this with clients um, and colleagues or even my team. I'd say, um, does that work for you? And what I found is not only is it yes or no, is it's very, ex I feel like this is where I want to get your take on this. I feel like it's very extreme because either I have to say yes or I have to go, no, it's horrible. But yeah. there's a gray area, right? Yeah. It, it, I, I share your sense on that. I um, I think the, the, the intent is to truly solicit, hey, how does that feel for you? Uh, right. My trick is like I, I heard don't ask binary questions, ask open-ended questions, blah, blah, blah. But to me, what I just – the, the, the rule that works for me is start the question with how mm. or maybe sometimes what, but start. So instead of saying, is that safe? Will it work? Does that work for you? Say, how's, how safe is it? How likely is that to work? Um, how well do you agree? How, how well do you agree with it? Or what sounds wrong with this? So, so one, it's um, two things. It's binary and it's sort of prejudicing the answer in the direction of, of agreement. So um, yeah. I would, yeah, maybe try something like, um, how, how do you feel about trying that yeah. or um, go with how? I, I was on an airplane, this was a couple years ago, it was across the Atlantic in the middle of the flight, the lights were off and everything. The lady stands up like two seats away and goes plop on, basically face down. She, she just fainted because she stood up too fast. and. Um, so the flight attendants come running over. They didn't know what happened initially. They come running, the lights come on, a lot of hubbub, commotion. Are you okay? Are you hurt? Binary, binary. In other words, they're making her decide if she's okay. They're making her decide mm -hmm. if she's hurt. And she's like, no, no, I'm fine. She's kind of in a fetal position. They plop her in the chair. They admit they're hurt. Like that's an off an embarrassing thing to even admit. Yeah, you know? right. She, she was embarrassed and like no one wants to say, oh, I'm hurt. I, I was on a bike ride. A, a guy, one of my, uh, the other guys hit a curb and crashed. He's lying on, he's lying down looking up. And the guy says, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm okay. Again, long later, we were like, no, don't get up. EMTs came. He had a broken pelvis. He was not oh okay. God. But so, so with this lady, so they put her next oh. to me and I'm like, few minutes go by and they turn the lights off and she seems okay. And I say, so how, how, like, how are you feeling? And she started talking. So she's talking to me, the amateur, but the professionals, she gets got no information out of her. And mm -hmm. that happens all the time. The reason why, Oh, cause she was not forthcoming. That's what we do in business. Oh, you, mm -hmm. uh, you had a chance to speak up. And no, you didn't. It's it's didn't ask the right questions. What you want to say is like, where does it hurt? How do you feel? Things like now I can answer because like exactly what you said, it's too dramatic. It's uh, what was the word? You said too dramatic. No, it's, it's too extreme. It's like you either have to, love it has to be all this or all yeah. that, and most of life occurs here. And so you're just kind of ruling out. Hey, here's a here's one I love: Is the COVID vaccine safe? That is the stupidest question <laughs> I've heard in a long okay. time. Because it it doesn't. You don't. Know, you actually don't learn anything. Mm. is flying safe is crossing the street safe again i don't learn anything if i say how safe is it now i'm going to learn something so i, I love this language though because i i'm 100 with you and i've learned a lot from you around how to think differently about how to think differently about the questions we ask and the language that we use even when we're giving direction 
You know, that it's not just asking someone so that they say the answer, but sometimes, right, if you're the CEO, you have information other people don't have. So you got to like give direction. But even that, right, it, there's a difference. If you've got a room full of leaders and thinkers who are being proactive, even that changes, doesn't it? Yeah. So we say give intent, not instructions. If you can mm -hmm. give intent, not instructions. Now, there's a caveat. If you if you need to give an order, uh, give an order and, and don't be a embarrassed about it and don't hide it. Yeah. We One of the exercises we do, I'll come back to the other thing, but one of the exercises we do is I show a video. It's an American Heart Association training video where they have a doctor and two nurses dealing with a patient who's going into cardiac arrest. And the doctor says, uh, he, he says to the nurse, Dana, let's go ahead and get an IV started now or so, something like ASAP because so let's go ahead and get it uh, 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 right now let's go ahead and get an IV started right now now that's like 13 words he, he should he should just say Dana IV start an IV yeah or, or Dana start an IV yeah. um or IV I don't think you need to say now because she's obvious. having a heart attack and the nurse knows that and 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 you don't Great say no, if it's not too much trouble if you really don't mind saving this person's life it would it would really be good so and i think what happens is because we we we've been taught okay command and control is bad but so then we got to be all inclusive and like let's get people on board like no we need to be able to have clear orders but but we don't want clear orders we don't want that to be the default we want to build the organization so things are coming up so ideally, the nurse would say, she's having a heart attack. I'm starting an IV or I intend to start an IV. That's how we would train the submarine um, yeah. to do it. And, uh, but the second thing is give intent on a structure. So a person comes to you and they say, you're the boss. The person comes and says, hey, I got a problem. I got to decide whether we're going to have this marketing campaign or that marketing campaign. And you look at them and you have, boom, you know the answer. It's this one. Don't say that. Don't give them the answer shot say what they what they're looking for is help on their thinking so you say okay well look maybe maybe it was a different example it's about launch the product don't launch the product so you say hey this is what's really important sometimes safety is paramount sometimes reputation is paramount sometimes speed to market is paramount right like if we just had a data breach and this is a patch it doesn't need to be perfect it doesn't need to be better than what we got so speed to market, like, yeah, now let's get it out. We'll fix it. We'll do another one in six hours. But it's just say, look, here's what's really important here. This client's mm -hmm. been a client with for the company for all this time, but what we can't risk problem with this client. Reprint everything. We'll eat it. Oh, but sometimes it might be the other way around. But right. try and give the 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 way I look at it is like a knobs. And, and, and the weighting of the knobs determines what the decision is. So you could say, do I vote for client A or, or uh, candidate A or B? Candidate A, uh, I like, and I, I, don't, I like and don't like one thing about each of them. Like one person has a, uh, supports abortion, but gun control or something like that. And so, so it's like, well, if abortion is more important for me, I vote here, but if gun control is more important. Right, I vote right. But, but it's all, it's, it's the same. They could have the exact same. Um, you and another person could both feel the same about abortion and gun control, gun control, but vote for different clients because your weights are different. Mm, that's really, I'm going to say that's a little bit profound there, David, because I think we sometimes, first of all, I think we forget that as humans, we're dynamic and there are different, me we attach different meanings to even the same thing or even the same value at the end of the day. I want to really quickly, it's a couple of things that you said that are so insightful that I just, I want to make sure I don't skip over and I just reiterate them for the audience because they're so important. One is you had said you act your way to mindset, not mindset your way to action or something like that. Yeah, we, I, act I, our way to, we act our way to new thinking. Yeah, I love that. And I, uh, I really just want to highlight that because it's always been my experience. It's kind of like, if I decide I'm going to run a marathon, right, I can't think about being a runner and be like, get myself in the mindset of a runner. I'm not going to be that person if I do that. I've tried that, right. actually. It doesn't work. Right. But it, didn't work. If I, it didn't work at all, actually. But if I put my shoes on and decide I'm going to start with a mile, 
yeah. over time, right? I get, I work my way, I work my way into being a runner. The exactly. mindset that I was actually looking exactly. for. Exactly. Yeah. So I I love that. And I just I want people to think about that because I think we get really trapped in like I've got to back up and fix my belief system, and I'm not opposed to fixing belief systems that aren't working for us, but I think we end up. How do I say this nicely? We think that's the action. We're like, well, I fixed my beliefs. Right. And then you're like, well, but what happens? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing happens. And then you end up in your old cycle. Right. So. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. yeah. I, that's that's how we see the world. And um, we would joke, like we say, oh, well, it's the thought that matters. Like, no, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's the well, thing that matters. I mean, you know, as we were saying earlier, research shows that action validates your brain. So if you take an act, right, you're actually validating the belief versus just thinking it. So, you know, it's, it makes more sense. So I, I wanted to highlight that because you said it a couple of times yeah. and I want everybody out there, regardless of what they're doing in their world to really think about that. Um, I want to go back to this kind of orders versus intent and deciding to change from, I, I just, I love the example you gave of one and 134 versus 135. Yeah. Here, here's been my experience. This is what I want. I, I really want to dig in with you is um, what I'll sometimes see is, in fact, it just happened to me a couple of weeks ago. I'll be working with a group of leaders. They want to make this change. Now, I'm not in the same field. I'm in innovation and, you know, personality archetypes. And so I'm in a little bit of different, coming from a different angle, but they want to be stronger leaders and they want their teams to be better creative problem solvers, be proactive, have ownership, right? All those things that we know makes a good leader. So what happens is they make the shift. It's like an earthquake. It's sudden. And they don't get the result they want immediately because they haven't, I think, made the room for learning, failure, working through it. Like, I feel like there's a, a muddy area you have to get through before you start to see the payoff. And maybe I'm wrong about that. So you tell me, but I want to spend a little time on what happens when you make the change, because I don't suspect that it always happens on just a straight curve up of like, or line up of like, it all went well because I decided to make this change. Because yeah. we're changing behaviors, right? We're changing habits. Yeah. So um, I see it in terms of two dimensions. One is um, production and the other is uh, production capability, say, or maybe it's decision-making capability. And so these are the decisions that support production. I, let's say we're a uh, automobile manufacturer. So the production is very visible. It's very cl clear to see it's cars and I can count them coming off the assembly line. And I say, you know what, this, this whole company runs just because I'm a genius and I keep making brilliant decisions. Mm -hmm. and I've, everyone's just essentially an extension of my will but I'm retiring or I know I'm eventually going to make a bad decision. So I need decision-making. So what happens is, and I, you, you take a slight dip in production to make an investment that your production capacity or your decision-making capacity in the future will be higher with the bet that then production will go up. And so, so, so the question is how long and deep are these dips now? If you're the sole shareholder, uh, it can be a pretty long and deep dip. But if it's too big and too deep, you end up out of business. So that's no yeah. good. Or if you're in a regular organization, you get fired. So it's a, it's a matter of kind of making these slow little dips that end up higher plateau, little dips, higher plateau. And again, uh, for us, it really was a focus on language. We had... We did have some dips on the submarine. We did make some mistakes. My boss was really amazing at incubating us or, or protecting us and letting us kind of work through those. But there were a lot of indicators that started just going up right, right away, which I think helped. But um, we were working with a research facility in Switzerland and the head of the research facility said, so how, how, like what, how can this go wrong? Well, there's a lot of excitement and energy at the beginning of yeah. uh, transformation. And so for the first three months, we'll be fine. But then what's going to happen is you just got to make sure these dips don't. I, uh, one of, we had a client where we had um, 
So the leader uh, of one unit was invited to take over the diabetes. This was in a healthcare, um, this might've been a Novo Nordisk. It was in a healthcare company, Scandinavian healthcare company. And he was invited to take over the diabetes unit, which wasn't doing very well. And he made a deal with his boss. He said, we're going to, we're going to report all the metrics that you normally see. We're going to, we're not going to stop reporting, but I don't, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about them for six months. I, I don't want to hear anything about it. I don't talk about it. It may go down, may go up. I don't know. I don't care because, and he had that written into his contract yeah. when he took over. And I was like, oh, well, that's good. That's guts to be able to say, hey, look, don't look at the metrics for six months. Um, but that bottom time, again, get through that dip and up to a higher level. So it's so interesting. This could sound like a tangent, but I swear it relates. So my my oldest son goes to CU Boulder. He's a freshman. And, you know, Deion Sanders just took over football there, right? So it's been interesting. There was this huge rush of excitement, and he won the games out of the gate, and then they dipped, and they started losing. And I was thinking about kind of what you're saying of how much of this, because I think he's pretty brilliant. So how much of this is him knowing this is a long game, and did he have those conversations with his people internally? And watching the crowd get so riled up at the dip, because I think at that bottom part, like you're saying, is when the naysaying and the judging and the jumping ship kind of really starts to happen because we're not prepared for the process. So I love that example you shared about that guy who's saying, hey, we're not looking at metrics. And I just I started wondering for people like Deion Sanders or any leader out there, is it really a matter of expectations? If you have the long game, do you really just have to say to people, hey, it's a J curve, right? This is not a straight shot up. So we're going to have a dip. Here's how we're handling it. Well, the, the, yeah, the fundamental problem, I think, is that we're evaluating people on outcomes which are not in our control. Yeah, that's true. And the other, it, <laughs> it, if the other team played brilliantly, like if you launched a product, let's say you started a restaurant on March 1st, 2020, it doesn't really matter how brilliant you were. It was going to go into the tank. Uh, because right. that's always when COVID hit. So um, w- you, we, we should always. So, so the problem is, it's a very weak signal. Sometimes we do a, a, an activity where we say, "Is buying a lottery ticket a good idea?" And what do people always say? Depends if you win. Well, yeah. you can't judge decisions based on the outcome. And, well, you can, but it's not a good strategy. You have to base the decision based on what you know when you make the decision. And so I said, well, okay, so so I get some, some people say, yes. I said, oh, great. So what if the person working for you said, I'm taking my whole budget this year. We're not going to show up at work. All we're going to do is buy lottery tickets. What do you think? Right. Oh, right. Right. So, yeah. so the point is the you got to focus your effort on what you can control, which is the input or like, what do you do? Like, are you answering phone calls in one ring? Are you... You know, inviting people like like what are the actions that you're taking, and then in the long run, it's going to work. It it will work out. But since it's a noisy signal, don't get fussed about that signal. But it's very emotionally, it's very hard to do when things are going down. Um, when things are going down, like if you're an investor in the market and you you, you decide, oh, I, you know, I I want to put some money in. The very next day, the market goes down. You're like, oh, oh blah, blah, blah. but then. Two years later, it, you look at the chart, you can't even see that. It's just whatever it happens to do. So, um, but I really love what you're saying, though, real quick on we're looking at the wrong signals. Like that just kind of really stopped me for a second there because um, I always talk about rewarding behaviors, not outcomes, because the outcomes are going to happen either way. Right? Yes, yeah, so if we want more of the outcomes that we want, really it's the behaviors. Otherwise, I feel like for employees, and particularly for your team, it's a little bit like Russian roulette because you don't know if it's going to land black or red and either they're going to love it and I'm going to get kick on Friday or like I'm going to be on the failure shelf, right? It's one of the two. And that doesn't feel good. So no, so people don't innovate. They don't bring ideas forward. They don't speak up in meetings. But I, I think kind of what you're saying about that we're looking at the wrong signals is even bigger than that. Um, Cause like my Deion Sanders, it's a great example. I'm basing it on does he win or lose games, but that is so out of his, not out of his control, but there's other variables. And maybe that's not the signals they're looking at. I don't know. I have no insider knowledge on this. So I love what you're saying around that. And I think that's a lesson that I hope everybody out there 
is really hearing of like, think about your measurables. And if you're measuring outcomes that are partially out of your control, I also think, and I'd love your opinion on this. I feel like when we get really outcome-based, we stop focusing on the behaviors that would have gotten us there. So we miss doing the things we should have done. Yeah. Um, Hollywood is really good at leading us astray here because we'll see, uh, you know, the climactic scene where something's happening. The, the one that's coming into my head right now is from that movie Asteroids. So I think it was Ben Affleck. He's like trying to yeah. drill a hole. They're going to put a nuclear weapon Before below it. The earth. Two halves go on both sides of the earth. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're all like, yeah, and he and like he he's in a machine with a drill, and he's like, you can do it, like a little more, and I like, push through, and and then it works, and we think that had anything to do with anything. No, it's like metallurgy, um, yeah. hydraulic pressure, drill bit design. That's determined a long time before whether this moment was going to be successful. So all this. But we get so excited mm -hmm. about we like as as humans we like that because then we see the hero and we get attracted yeah. to it and I all the work. Good. Yeah. So, but one thing I just thought of something when you were um, yeah. talking about your innovation thing, which is let invite people to talk in probabilities. For for mm -hmm. me, this is a huge game changer. We talk about psychological safety a lot. It's it's a theme that clients are interested in. And we just say like one big step forward is let people say percentages. So if you say, if you say in a meeting, um, hey, I got a reservation. So that's already kind of scary. I got a reservation right. on this product. I think there may be a security vulnerability. Well, and then it turns out there's no security vulnerability. Now you were quote wrong. And then people talk bad about you and it's embarrassing. But all that is just made up stuff that we've done. If you say, hey, there's a four, I, I think there's a potential security vulnerability. I'm like 5% sure. Now everyone knows where you're at on this thing. And, but if it's true, it's a big, and, and the leader can decide, hey, um, I'm going to take that risk. Or I'm 50% sure. I'm 90, like that, that like it, it's either really low or middle or high. Like don't get to like a 47.5%. Right. <laughs> But I, I really wanted to, so on a submarine, we always, we're always dealing in ambiguity, which is everything about the future is ambiguity. It's uncertainty. And so yeah. uh, invite people to talk like the weather man and say, hey, the, the weather people would never be suckered into saying whether it would, it's going to rain tomorrow. They're smarter than that. It's like a 40% chance of rain. <laughs> right. Well, and you in Colorado. An umbrella, you didn't bring on a rain, that's on you. Yeah. <laughs> So wait, I want to um, I want to highlight something here because I what I'm hearing you say kind of from a couple different things is and I love this percentages idea I never thought about that and I, I would assume that that really because I've never done it here that that allows people to speak up and feel to your point there's some psychological safety to it because I think there's a big difference between between raising your hand and saying I don't think that launching this product or, is a good idea. And right. I've got 5% reservations here that this is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, because we're so good at Monday morning quarterbacking as humans, you know, we see, particularly in marketing and advertising, right, or products, you see companies roll stuff out. And later on, we're like, did nobody in the conference room realize that was a bad idea, right? We see it all the time, particularly yeah. in advertising, I think. So I wonder if that just allows people to feel safe because you, if you're 5% hesitant or 5% resistant to something, that's a lot different than being like, I am 100% not on board with this idea, which maybe you are. But if I say I'm 5% unsure about this, anyways, I'm talking in circles, but I hope you know what I mean. It just, it seems to me that that feels safer to say the things that you want to say without it being all or none. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. We just had the example of, Lego ran an ad with some AI generated characters and one of them, so they kind of looked mm -hmm. fake and one of them had six fingers. Yep. And <laughs> it was a big mistake. And that's the one, right? That the rest of us go, did nobody realize? Right, which like, is, it, it, okay. I can tell you in the Navy, every time a ship runs aground, 
and and it'll be true with this um the bridge yeah the dolly running into the bridge i i i willing to put a hundred thousand dollars and i guarantee you that there were indications of problems beforehand like the ship that out of the blue lose all power there was something going on ahead of time and there were indications there's always indications ahead of time uh that that there's a problem and the question is one is the organization attuned to listen to those indications right and two is then were they is what was it an environment where people felt that they could vocalize them in the navy 100 percent of all collisions and groundings were preceded by some sort of Harbinger or some sort of an indication that the ship was standing in the danger, which either wasn't voiced or wasn't listened to. And sometimes it's not voiced because the person says, well, no one's going to listen to me anyway. So why should yeah. I? Yeah. I mean, I think that's true in life and in work. Anytime, like once the outcome happen happens, if you look backwards, the signals were, they were always there in some right. way or right. another across everything that we do in life and work. So I, but I really like what you're saying about the percentages because I think I'm getting a lot of thank yous in the chat bar for that one. I think that's a, a real indi a real way to allow those conversations to happen versus what sometimes happens is we want these things. We want people to speak up, but then we go, what do you think? Does that work for you? Right. All the things you were saying before. And then that, that shuts everything back down. Right. So right. you also talk about pushing, let me see if I say this right, pushing ownership to where the, no, is that right? Ownership where the information is? Authority to information. Authority to information. Thank you. Yeah. So this uh, is how I thought about it. On the, yeah. Go ahead. No, no. I just want you to talk about that because I think a lot of what we're saying is, and not permission, right? Because permission means let's find a way to shut it down. Yeah. How do you get all those people to elevate their game? Yeah, so this is how I thought about it on the submarine. I mean, I think there's a condition in, in hierarchies, which it's, I kind of believe it's basically an unavoidable condition. So I, I don't, we don't really, really worry about changing it. We just worry about how we deal with it. And the condition is there's more information on the periphery of the hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, of the organization that the interface with either the client or the product than there is in the middle, but there's more authority in the middle. So there's a gap between authority mm -hmm. and the rest in the middle and the information on the, on, on the edges. So the traditional approach, so I check into a hotel. This is in San Diego a couple of years ago, and I was going to be there for a couple of days and it wasn't cheap. So I was going to spend a couple grand at this hotel. And, and it was one of the things where they're going to come uh, land at the airport. It was around midnight, it had been long flights, tired. And I was supposed to call them and they send the car. And uh, so I call them. I'm like, well, how, how long is it going to be? Oh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I mean, you've been there, right? And call, yeah. no car. Oh, 15 minutes. 15, another 15 minutes. Uh, finally showed up like 45 minutes. Now, it was a, the place I literally could have walked there in that length of time. So if they, she just told me 45 minutes to begin with. I said, I'll get an Uber or I'll walk or something else. Right, no problem. But, yeah. Yeah, forget it. But so, so, and, Anyway, so I show up and at the front desk, and now it's like one in the morning. And the person who I was talking to on the phone is the person at the ran in the front desk because this lean team. And so she knows that she did me wrong. She's looking at the thing. She knows I'm uh, whatever Marriott person and loyal, and I'm staying here. Blah 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 blah. So she feels bad. She says, "Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, I." I had the wrong word i'm sorry I took a, and she was truly sorry and she says i'll put in for um you know i'll let my i'll escalate this i'll let the manager the day manager know so she has to type in a note hey blah blah blah, blah take, effort. explain the nuance and then two days later i get this thing it says oh breakfast is on us and literally i don't care anymore yeah and, and no, what, 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 yeah so we call that pushing information to authority. She's filling out a form that's trying to make it clear to someone in authority that this was a situation and it warrants free breakfast or some compensation. What you want instead is push the authority for decisions to the people who natively have the information. So if, if you have the word escalation in your company, see if you can get rid of it. What you that's want is, is 
her, I mean, is it really such a momentous thing to say, look, breakfast on us or, or whatever, just like let the person make decisions. But so many times in organizations, I was dealing a thing with, with a big, with my investment uh, managing company, I won't name them. And literally uh, for something, it was like, a, it was, there was um, anyways, it, it was like a, on the order of a thousand something dollar error. And the guy I'm talking to said, oh, let me put you in my supervisor. Talk to, now I'm talking to the supervisor and he says, I can authorize $250. <laughs> like, what? This is like a multi-trillion dollar company. And, you, and I'm not even at the first level anymore. So, well, let me put you, like, it's crazy. Let, like, monitor and have, because now they'll be invested in making good decisions. So we call right. it push the authority to, you get tighter do loops. There's a sense of ownership. It's more fun for people. They want to make decisions. They, they, this person at the desk felt bad. And so just let people make decisions. I mean, you still want to sort of bound, you want to bound it at some point, but Marriott's not going to go bankrupt because some desk clerk is allowed to give people comp and breakfast. <laughs> I mean, look, the food is there and it's most of it goes bad anyway. So, I mean, it, it, it's like one of those funny, to me, it's one of those funny things where I'll, I'll tell you on that note, I, there's a restaurant in Monterey that I absolutely love and it's called the Fish House and they have incredible fresh oysters and like all the things that you expect in the coast of California. What I love most about them is the last couple of times I've been there and I've needed something, the person who happened to be closest to me was the busboy. So I turned to him and I said, hey, would you mind getting us six more? raw oysters. And he said, no problem. Went to the bar, got the oysters, right? And came back. So this is the bus boy. Just to pose that to another restaurant I went to where I said, hey, can I get, I don't know, more ketchup? It was like the most basic yeah. request. And the right. person said, let me go get your waiter. And I was like, are you kidding me? Now the waiter has to come over. I have to repeat it for ketchup. Like this is right. the most ridiculous situation ever. Yeah. And it's the oh. little thing. Yeah. Or I'll, I'll tell them. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell them. I'll let them know. I'll, I'll let, let them, know. them know. It's the they them, right? Like, well, who's them? I thought you didn't. You work? Don't you work here? Oh yeah, I'll tell them. Yeah, that I love that, and it, it reminds me. Here's uh, listeners. Here's something you can do. I love this. Go when you go to a restaurant. Try not to order. See if you get the server to choose your meal for you. Oh. And this is this is part of act our way to uh, new thinking because we're going to practice empowerment. So you're going to quote empower your your server to make a decision. Now we and and this in our language this is a level six decision because we're saying I want them to just choose your meal, put it in front of you, and that's when you know what you're going to have. Now the reason we like this is because if, if you can't do that at a restaurant where you like yeah. nothing bad's going to happen. I mean, if you're allergic to peanuts, you probably and like that's on you to tell them. That's right, clarity. Right. But, but it's about pushing the authority to, to the person who's closer to the information, which is what what looks good coming out of the kitchen, what's the place known for, all these kind of things, and let them make a decision. We we have um, we have all of our new clients executives go through this, and they come back with stories, and we typically. The pattern is higher end restaurants like the fish house. They'll be happy to say that. Sometimes they're going to want your approval. They'll say, well, what do you think about? And I say, oh, it's on you. Like you choose. Um, but typically lower end like McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, they're like, what? And they look at you like three right. heads. So <laughs> one of our executives clients went into a Chick-fil-A, Grant did this, and the the lady behind the counter says, does it have to be on the menu? I'm like, no. <laughs> so he gets a custom meal. That's Number awesome. Two, one. one, how awesome is that? Number two, think about think about her day, though. Think about her day, as opposed to yeah, just she getting worse. Sure. people. Yeah, she went home and was telling her family what a cool day she had. And so this is the same thing that's going to happen in our teams. When we stop telling people what to do. We say, well, you know, you... You pick, you decide. Now, 
in a team, I like intent. Hey, here's what I intend to bring. And you, like, we can do a course mm -hmm. correct, but just going to try to push it a little bit harder. We always say, like, take this to level six, yeah. which is like, just like, the secret is you need to make it safe for them to make this decision because they know everyone's on on Yelp these days and they don't want a bad review. So it's all about safety. But it's, again, it's like you got to get out and kick a soccer ball. So practice. See Love what's going to make it safe, this person, what doesn't. And then you can do it at work. If you can't do it in a restaurant, you got to know you're hopeless. Yeah. Well, I really – that's a great – so I, first of all, I encourage all the viewers, listeners to actually go try it. Go to a restaurant and be like, you you decide. I feel yeah, like yeah, I yeah. something like, I'm feeling adventurous. You decide. Like, I'm open tonight. You make Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you gotta set it up in a, like a connection and yeah. a story. So you're already, yeah, you're already getting some of the secrets, but just try yeah. it. You're cool. Well, it's been a good podcast here. I'm getting a lot. This is like self-help for me. Yeah. So I, I want, I want self -help. to really self-help. That's right. I want to go back to the word you've used a few times now, which is clarity. And then I want to make sure before we end to talk about your book coming out. So I just know that that's, I want that next. Um, and I have so many other questions like about the phrase, I don't know, but you're going to have to go to David's website and, and learn about that too. Um, I want to share, and maybe we'll find the time to squeeze it in because it's so good. So I want to share just something that happened to me recently and your thing about clarity, I think really just made me realize why it was a little bit of a cluster so I, I, I'm on a board of a nonprofit here in Colorado, and we've got a national board. And the national asked me for something. And the truth is, I was delayed in getting it. I just, I got busy with work. I just, it, it dropped, I didn't see the deadline at the bottom. So I messed up in that one. But then I got an email back saying, hey, Tamara, um, just following up, if you've had a chance to look at this, no rush. Just want to make sure, like, they were so afraid to say to me, look, we really need this from you this week. Like, could you make an effort. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'll get right to it. And of course I got busy with work and another couple of days went by. And then I realized, oh my God, I have to get this to her. So I went back to it and got it. And that's not usually how I operate, but I've had two spring breaks, two clients, like it, it all just happened at the same time, right? Totally on me. So I um, then sent it back to her. And, but I got into a little bit, I think we, I caused accidentally a little bit of friction because I missed her deadline. But I didn't realize it because the email was so talking in circles and I was so talking in circles back of like, oh, my God, I'll get right to it. But I didn't say when I didn't. I wasn't clear. She wasn't clear. So we got through and all great. But I as you're talking about the importance of clarity, I'm realizing, wow, no wonder people don't get you stuff on time. People don't deliver people when they ask questions, don't get the answers they're looking for us because there's a whole level of clarity that I think we miss. Maybe it's. I don't know if it's we're people pleasers or we're trying not to ruffle feathers. I don't know. I'll let you take it from here, but clarity is key. Yeah. So a lot of times uh, when we think about clarity, it's like dialing those knobs. Like this one is really mm -hmm. like time to market is really right. important. Like we're turn, turn that knob up. Uh, I like your story a lot because. Um, Cause I bombed. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> no, I, because like no rush is okay. There's no rush. It, it, if there's really a deadline, don't pretend like there's not a deadline. Right. Uh, but the other thing is we would see like my boss wants it on Friday. So I tell my team I want it Wednesday and they tell their team they need it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we're all putting buffers on buffers. Like what is the actual right. deadline? And the other thing is like, why? So if she says something like, Look, mm. we're we're we have a big uh, donors conference on Thursday, and this is one of the things we want to talk about. And we think we need three days, like maybe right. they aren't that much of it, but like, hey, we need this, and we need this to support right. the donors conference next Thursday. So now you know there's like re like there's a it's not like oh, I'm just nervous about what you're going to give me, and um, um, so therefore. Uh, I need to see it. Uh, it's like there's a real reason, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about you, but sometimes, like, uh, I'll get a client and they'll they'll want my slides ahead of time. Always, yeah. And 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 they'll say it's for AV. This happened a couple. Oh. Months ago. They want to say I want the slides for AV. Like, okay, great. I'll send it to you the night before. I mean, how long does it take to load up or whatever? 
And then, and we had this really sort of awkward, I think we're working for a speaker through a speaker's bureau. And then we kind of had this awkward, no, we actually want them next week. Well, then it's not for AV. It's so that you can look through it. And for that, and if you do, fine, I'm not trying to hide anything, but like, well, let's, be, yeah, let's be honest about it. It's, Oh, we got to pass it through our DEI filter before, and it's going to take. Okay. Time. Okay, we'll yeah. say that. And I like I, we've seen, I've seen contracts where it says speak on this day, slides due on this day, first mm -hmm. draft. Like, I, and I'm like, I don't, I don't always love it, but I like, I like it. It's clear, and like, there's no. Okay, great. And I put all those things in my calendar. I'm like, okay, slides. Here you go. Boom. And there's no hard feelings or anything like that. But I, so I'm laughing because uh, I just had that recently and I, you know, everyone takes a personality assessment for us before they get there. And so we do a heat map of the room so they can understand kind of the patterns of the people and their thinking styles in the room. But that means that I don't typically get to do the heat map until about 72 hours before, because you've got the people who do it immediately. And then you've got the people who do it the last minute. Right. Always. So I'll send my slides early saying, Hey, but know that I'm changing them. And then they're like, no problem. Just bring them the day up. And I'm like, well, what happened to you need him three weeks early for AV? Like this doesn't, so it doesn't make sense. But I, but I love what you're saying, which is just be clear and tell them what matters. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, okay. So real quick, let's go into why I don't know, because now I'm getting questions. I don't know what. <laughs> so <laughs> Everything apparently. Um, yeah. Tell me so why that matters. All learning starts with, I don't know. As soon as you or the organization say, we know this, we got this licked, you shut the door on, on learning because there's no sense right. learning something that you already know. It's the things that you don't know. So, And it starts with the leader. So if the leader, it, it, in, in the typical structure, leaders make, know the, we link knowing and telling. The person who knows tells, the person who tells needs to know. And so knowing is highly valued. Curiosity or not knowing is not highly valued. So as a leader, you need to endorse that trait of not knowing because that's going to trigger learning in you and the organization. So I would, I had to get, I wasn't super ever really, I'd say comfortable, but I think you want to know the answer. You want to be the final, you want to be the goalie uh, for the organization. So if no one else is kicking the ball in the back in the direction that you're going to catch it, but you don't, want to always be the one who ends up with the ball. So you want to uh, know, but don't tell. And you want to practice saying, I don't know, even if you don't, even if you think, you know, just say, I don't know, like, what, what do you guys, like, let's run an experiment. What, what are this test in the market? Let's, let's, how can we, and, and, and then it'll be okay for them to say they don't know. I've been in organizations where everyone pretended to know stuff that they didn't, really weren't that you know once as you drill down into it yeah it was like how is like how does a zipper work oh oh yeah Do you know how a zipper works yeah tell me um i was at a meeting once in procter and gamble and i look brilliant people at png so don't get me wrong but they were they use a lot of acronyms and it was about 15 people in the meeting and me as the outsider consultants and right. they were throwing around a lot of acronyms and people were nodding their head, nodding their head. And finally I spoke up because I have permission to, right? I, I'm the outsider. So I can say, I don't know what AABL means. Right. And one person said, so I looked at the person who said it and they stopped and they went, and you could see like the panic in their face. They didn't, half the people in the room didn't know what the acronyms meant. I love that. I love that. I, I walk into an organization I have um, a logo on the wall. And then it'll be written in Latin or something. And I say, hey, what does like e pluribus una mean? <laughs> they were like, well, it's on the wall right out there. <laughs> anyway. Um, but real quick on I don't know, because correct me if I'm wrong, but you even used that when you were captain of USS Santa Fe, right? And yeah. you're coming to this new submarine and you truly don't know. What do you think saying that to your people, what that did to their confidence in you? and to their willingness to step up and be leaders. Because I think it's, it's, it's even more than learning. It's what that does for others too. Yeah, well, it sets an example. It's okay for them to say they don't know. So then they, so that it gets the learning cycle going, moving forward. 
what did it do for their confidence in me? Well, the the truth of the matter is they knew I probably didn't know because they knew their captain left abruptly. They knew I was trained for another. They, I mean, they know all that. Right. And so if I came in say, pretending to know everything, they would have known I was a stuffed shirt pretending to know stuff. And um, there was this really critical moment I remember where uh, I was asking questions and the sailor said, I don't know. And then they looked at me and like, and I really had to make a decision. Do I admit, I don't know also, because that's when the captain would normally say, you know, get this professorial voice out and explain what it really did. And fortunately I, I was so shook up that I just said, yeah, I don't know either. but um, it, it really, I think it set a standard for honesty that mm -hmm. was really helpful. So in terms of confidence, like, they were going to battle with me, not because they knew all the answers, but because they knew we as a team were going to come out alive. What a great way to sum up everything we just talked about. Like, Because they knew as you were a team and everybody had a part in it, not you and then a bunch of people doing stuff that you said to do. It's, a, it's such a drastic shift, I think, for teams of any kind. And I know you experienced that with a lot of your clients. Um, before we run out of time, I want to make sure to just talk a little bit about what you're working on now, because we, we were talking about it offline before we went live. And I, yeah. I'm really excited. I'm excited to have you back on. And it's kind of more future based thinking. So yeah. talk a little bit about it. So the idea is we're, we're it's a book about making better decisions in our in our mm -hmm. in the moment and business and life and life. And we all know that one of the problems making our decisions is that we're invested in us and our egos influence. Yeah. And we want to, um, we're reluctant to admit that decisions we made in the past were suboptimal and we become defensive and we, um, uh, escalation of commitment and, and all these kinds. Of, so all these things that don't have anything to do with the facts get in the way of making better decisions. And so, uh, what, what we're saying is ego is a condition being immersed in it is a choice mm. and the wow. basically the approach over the last five thousand years has been um extinguish the self through buddhism or focus on others or um do mindfulness and, and all these things which are trying to get at the problem of our self but there's another part of the equation which is that we view the world very if i said draw me two circles what represents your yourself and what represents a circle that represents how you're looking at the, your perspective at where you're looking at the world. Most people, they like right on top of it, like I'm in here looking out here. Well, mm -hmm. why don't you like be on the wall looking down this way, be on the balcony, look down at you this way or be your future. So you can do this in time, space. You can do it psychologically in time and in space. So be in the stands looking down at you on the playing field, not, I'm the quarterback looking through my helmet. Be in the be your future self. Be 80 years old. Don't consider yourself at 80. Actually become your 80-year-old self in your yeah. mind and say, now I, this is what Jeff Bezos did to help him make the decision to start Amazon. And then think back, what, would, what am I going to regret more? And so when you do this, what's happening is you're out here, you create psychological distance. All these things, there's a research shows that you're, you become more emotionally stable, your reaction to things, you get cut off in traffic and then you zoom out. Like if you're here, oh, yeah. well, you did this to me. Like now you're out here and you just go become your future self. Tomorrow, you're not even gonna remember this, it's not even matter, so who cares? Like just nothing. And um, so be someone else, be somewhere else, be sometime else. And the, and the best person we think that wraps it all up is be your coach. Imagine you're your own coach and you jump out, your coach decides, you know, David, they talk to you in the third person. You write, you can write in your journal, yeah. write in your journal. David had a great day. He was a little unhappy with one thing, blah, 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 blah. He's all upset about this. When you do that, you have less emotional reactance. You're calmer. You re, you reimagine things in a more helpful way. And, and when you have to make decisions, you get a lot of this baggage out of the way. So, so it's you know, you know, typical, you know, with their stories and research and these three main tools. 
but uh, I've been working on it. Uh, I've been working on it like with my relationship with my parents, which has been prickly for a while and uh, making decisions here in the business. And uh, we working with clients and then we know from people who are particularly good investors or businessmen, business people that they, they see they're able to do this at, at when at they call it up and they can do it. And then they're making better decisions. Do you think, and maybe this is what you're saying, do you think if you step outside your immediate self, your current self, and particularly you're talking about time and space, like looking into the future, it becomes easier to make the better decisions today for that future self, so to speak? Yeah. So um, in the future self, uh, we know, like, if I imagine my future self, um, I'll make better, if I can get really close to my future self, the, the problem is it's hard to feel your emotions at your future self. And I've done this so many times. I'll see, like, I'm going to speak from eight to 10 and then I'm going to catch an Uber. I'm going to go to the airport and I have 45 minutes before the plane leaves. And I say, Oh, that's a good, I'm going to work on my book. <laughs> but, but when it, in the moment, like I'm, emotionally trashed because I just came off stage and I'm trying yeah. and, and there's always a now I'm worried about missing my cake and I'm not going to do it. So you got to get close to your uh, future self. Uh, two, two examples. One is this Bezos one. He imagined when he was 80, what would he regret more starting Amazon and failing or not starting? And um, we all know what he decided. So yeah. frame it. So when you're on the far side of a decision, looking backwards, it frames in your mind like regret. Oh, why didn't I move to Europe? Why didn't I learn a language? Why didn't I? Right. Why didn't I say that thing? Why, why didn't, didn't I, I do right. exactly? Why didn't I, um, you know, spend more time with my parents before they kind of passed away? Whatever. And on the submarine, I I would do it in six months. I because I was sort of in this operational thing, and I would say uh, I had a calendar which was always set six months to the future. And then every day the day flipped, I would flip the calendar. So it was always six months ahead. And I would look at that. And I had a decision to make. I mean, some of these are small, like who should we have drive the submarine into port? Right, right. And if I'm stuck in today, I say, well, we're going to be inspected. You're almost always inspected. It's like we're close to land and bridges. We, we don't want to. So I'm always going for the best person. But then, but I would look at the thing and say, six months from now, what do I wish we did? Well, I wish we had a well-rounded portfolio so that all the officers could drive the ship into port. And like, I'd rather have 10 officers be able to do it at 90% than one officer at 99 and everyone else at five. And so when you look at, they say, well, okay. So I would, I would inhabit, I would inhabit that future body. And I would almost be talking backwards to myself. I say, well, what do I want the David of today to do? Well, we should, you know, we got to spread, even though it might be a little more hard, like it might be a little more pain today, um, it's going to be better in the long run. I love this. And, and so that's, so I would do that. And we ended up in a lot of different dimensions. You're going to make better decisions uh, if you can just sort of think about it from a future self and then look back to today. So, hurry up and get the book published because or launched because um maybe it's because i'm yeah, no, hurry up david I, maybe because i'm 51 i'm at that weird inflection point where it's like i have a life to look at and go i wish i had done some things differently i'm glad i did some things but also the future is close so right. i want to make sure the decisions i make today and i think I, you get to 51 before you realize it too by the way but the, the decisions i make today are the ones that are really going to impact the future for me in the right way. And I love that story about, well, in six months, I want to have a well, well-rounded, you know, group of officers. That's a whole different decision-making than, okay, we're going to have an inspection. It's a little bit choppy out, like whatever the decisions are in the moment. Yeah, so two total, those are two totally different decisions. Um, so, and, and I, let me just end it by saying that I am constantly busted talking to myself in the airport, the grocery store. So now it's going to be in third person because now I'm going to try that. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, so science, the science of shows that this is like ran a thing like, um, uh, uh, so yeah. these are people on exercise bikes and are measuring output and perceived exertion. And they, one group said, I can do it. One group said, 
either you can do it or David can do it. And those people did better. So you want, you want wow. the voice in their head and it works for a couple of reasons. One is you don't want to let that person down. Yeah. Like now, like this is like a supportive friend. You don't want to let them. So you're externalizing a little bit the, the thing. So, but look, you're, you're not even halfway there. Uh, I think we think too small. Like I'm living to 110. You probably can live to 120. Um, and, and, uh, we'll like, like, like think, like, don't say, oh, my parents lived to 90, so I might make it to 92. I don't, like, we're not thinking big yeah. enough in our lives. And it changes the way mm -hmm. you invest and you think and you take care of your body. But say, like, look, you're you're living to 110. And, I, I, and I've started doing this recently, and I'm taking care of better myself. And I, don't, I might not make it, but if I'm, if my goal is, well, I'm only going to live to, like, 85, then... It's, I'm much more likely to, not to make 110. Well, and, and I love that. I, I love that so much. And you look at, um, like, you know, I know a lot of people my age who are retiring. I put that in quotes when you when you hear it later. And what right. it means for them really is, like, they're done. They're done. And they're 51, 60. And I, I look at that, and I feel like I'm just getting started on whatever this next wave is. But I, but I do think it's a really important thing to not to do what you're saying, which is think big and think about the impact of your decision today. Because if you're thinking big, what you do today really makes a difference, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like I think, like let's say, let's say you've been doing this. I just make up a number for 30 years since you were 20. So that's yeah. 30 years. You could do something new for 30 years. You? for 30 years and then still do something new again for 30 more years. So you're like you're one third of the way through your chapters of these, you could have big contributions, like whatever it is. So think like, just think big, think bigger about what you can do and with your life and your contribution. And like, Oh, I'm not going to hit. I'm going to stay around till I see my kids married. No, I'm going to stay around and see my great grandkids married. Mm -hmm. I, okay, what a great way to end the episode. I love it. David, thank you so much. I'm, I, this has been so insightful. The comments are all loving it and which I knew they would. So I'm glad that we have you back on. I hope you'll come back on when the book releases or something, you have something else to say. Me I, too. I just, I, I think the lessons in this are really important, um, not just for leaders at work. I mean, we spend a lot of time at work. So I think work really matters in a lot of ways. And but I also think in life, there's a lot of lessons here about how you, your relationships with other people and how you build um, communities that grow together. And whether that community is your family or your neighbors or like, I think it transcends kind of the cube. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks all listeners for sticking with us. Amazing.